one. Now, I know that it's hard to keep up on top of what's going on in the Holy Land, but if you want to know more about what's happening here in Israel, I'm Aaron Porras, and this is the Weekly Review. As Netanyahu left the Prime Minister's office in June 2021, he left a single note to his successor, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, reading, Be right back. And now, after 14 months in the opposition, the prophetic paper fulfilled. The votes in Israel's fifth serial election in fewer than four years have been counted, and the right-wing bloc under Netanyahu's leadership poised to form a coalition and retake government control. To that end, Netanyahu already well into negotiations with his would-be coalition partners, including the two Haredi parties, the religious Zionism faction, and his own Likud party members, to dole out ministries and other senior positions. In fact, according to reports, the Likud leader hoping to hit the ground running by presenting a functional lineup for government along with the swearing-in of the 25th Knesset long before the clock to actually begin coalition negotiations even begins. But hard compromises likewise already on the horizon, with several MKs demanding the same top positions. It's allegedly clear that firebrand religious Zionism MK Itamar Benkvir will become internal security minister, but little else has been decided. Israeli media reporting that several top Likud MKs are fighting over the Justice Ministry as well as the Finance, Defense, and Foreign Ministry. Then Likud MK and former UN Ambassador Danny Danon saying that the only job he'll take is as Speaker of the Knesset, while the Likud's former Transportation Minister Miri Regev will likely retake the position despite her desires on the Foreign Ministry as well. Ari Ederi, leader of the religious Shas party, meantime, will likely get his pick of the litter, though it's reported that Netanyahu wants Derry to take the finance ministry, if not to keep it for the Likud. Netanyahu does not, apparently, want to give the finance portfolio to the religious Zionism party under Bezalel Smotrich. Instead, unsourced reports alleging that Bibi wants to offer Smotrich the education or justice portfolio, but Smotrich is eyeing finance or defense. Moving on, following an IDF raid in Jenin in which an Islamic Jihad terrorist was killed, red alert rocket sirens sounding late Thursday night near the Gaza periphery. Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants in Gaza firing rockets and gunfire towards civilian communities in southern Israel. One volley of Palestinian rockets was intercepted by the Iron Dome defenses, while a second volley falling back inside the Strip. This was the first Gaza rocket attack since the three days of fighting between Israel and the Islamic Jihad in August. Israel, meantime, responding to the attack by launching heavy targeted airstrikes in Gaza early Friday morning. And there were no injuries, but video of the Israeli strikes showing multiple explosions in a concentrated area. The targets reportedly including an underground rocket manufacturing site belonging to the Hamas organization. While Islamic Jihad fired the initial rockets, Israel holds Hamas as the governing body in Gaza responsible for any and all attacks. And then in conjunction with several other strikes in recent months, Israel suppo supposedly significantly impeding the rocket intensification and armament attempts of the Hamas terror group. Israelis solemnly marking the 27th anniversary of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin's assassination on Sunday with official commemorations and memorials at the Knesset, and presumptive incoming Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu condemning the assassination as a nauseating attack on democracy while urging for unity across the aisles in the wake of these divisive serial elections, comments mirroring that of his outgoing counterpart, Yair Lapid. <laughs> שמדינת ישראל הייתה ותהיה מדינת הלאום של העם היהודי. ישראל היא מדינה שבה זכויות אזרח שמורות לכולם, בלי יוצא מן הכלל. אנחנו פה יחד. דתיים וחילונים וימנים ושמאלנים ואנשי מרכז. חילוקי הדעות הם אמיתיים, הם עמוקים, לפעמים הכרחיים, אבל מעל הכל יש לנו אחריות משותפת. אין שום טעם בהזכרה הזאת, אין שום טעם ביום הזה, אם לא נלמד מזה משהו. אם לא נפיק את הלקח. הדבר שעלינו ללמוד מחייו ומותו של יצחק רבין, הוא שאהבת מולדת היא קודם כל ולפני הכל. אהבת האנשים שחיים איתך באותה מולדת. But the official ceremony marred by controversy when far-right religious Zionism MK Bezalel Smotrich took to the podium. Smotrich first lamented Rabin's murder, saying it was an act that crossed every red line of a democratic society.
but he then went on to argue that his objections to Rabin's policies at the time and today are no more than the essence of such a democracy, not incitement. Now, this in and of itself is not really cause for controversy. What was found to be particularly offensive was when Smotrich blamed the Shin Bet, Israel's premier security organization, with encouraging Rabin's murder. <laughs> ומי שכשל בשמירה על ראש הממשלה יצחק רבין הם לא אנשי הימין והציונות הדתית, הם לא המתנחלים שזעקו בצדק נגד מדיניות ראש הממשלה והממשלה שבראשותו, אלא שירותי הביטחון שלא רק שכשלו בשמירה עליו, אלא גם השתמשו במניפולציות חסרות אחריות שעד היום לא נחשפו במלואן כדי לעודד את הרוצח לבצע את זממו. Essentially, Smotrich saying that the Shin Beit used manipulations to goad right-wing extremist Igal Amir to follow through with his plan. This in reference to a later acquitted Shin Beit agent who had infiltrated Amir's circle but failed to prevent the attack. By contrast to Smotrich, meantime, sources in the security agency decrying the MK's conspiracy theories that promote extremist discourse. It's been five days since the election. Maldives declared victory of the right in the elections, and three days after the official results confirmed it, but the President of the United States, Joe Biden, still has not called to congratulate his old friend, Benjamin Netanyahu. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, did not call either. American officials said that Biden is expected to talk with Netanyahu in the coming days and have different views on why it still hasn't happened. Some say Biden is focused on the party's effort to win the midterm elections, which are being held tomorrow in the USA. However, a former senior official in the political system believes that this is an excuse and that the delay in conversation is no accident. According to him, Netanyahu took a few good days to congratulate Biden on his election victory against Trump in 2020. And he only did so when it became clear beyond any doubt that Trump had indeed lost in the U.S. Most of the congratulations have so far come from the Republican side of the map. Welcome back, Netanyahu. You've been missed, tweeted former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, while Senator Rick Scott said of Netanyahu, a strong leader and a good friend of America. What a wonderful day for Israel and the USA. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Opportunity for world leaders to show solidarity and take concerted action when and where needed most. Much of this year's focus is expected to relate to loss and damage wrought by climate change with wealthy... Excellencies, this UN climate conference is a reminder that the answer is in our hands. And the clock is ticking. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising. And our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. Inaction is myopic and can only defer climate catastrophe. The inclusion of this agenda reflects a sense of solidarity and empathy with the suffering of the victims of climate-induced disasters. And to this end... Friends, we are not currently on a pathway that keeps 1.5 in reach. And whilst I do understand that leaders around the world have faced competing priorities this year, we must be clear, as challenging as our current moment is, inaction is myopic and can only defer climate catastrophe. The inclusion of this agenda reflects a sense of solidarity and empathy with the suffering of the victims of climate-induced disasters. And to this end, we all owe a debt of gratitude to activists and civil society organizations who have persistently demanded a space to discuss funding for loss and damage and thus provided the impetus needed to bring this matter forward. Hundreds of Israelis, led by President Isaac Herzog, are attending this year's Global Climate Conference. Dozens of Israeli climate innovation events are planned, many around what will be Israel's first national pavilion in the history of the Global Confab's 27 years. It is also the first Israeli pavilion of its kind on Egyptian soil since a 1985 business conference in Cairo. A year ago, then Prime Minister Naftali Bennett pledged that Israel would reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. 
Bennett made his commitment just before COP26 in Glasgow alongside Energy Minister Karim el Harar. Israel decided against the government decision on the matter ahead of the elections. Attempts earlier this year to get the net zero commitment included in the climate bill failed, primarily because of finance ministry opposition. The bill did pass its first reading, committing Israel to reducing emissions by 85 percent by 2050. Net zero refers to a situation in which a country effectively reduces its emissions to zero. This can be done by investing in projects that reduce emissions or that absorb carbon dioxide from the air and either use it in industry or convert it into a form that can be buried for a long time. The 2015 Paris Agreement commits all signatories, including Israel, to reach carbon neutrality in emissions during the second half of the 21st century. And now let's shift focus to the Elephant Brokerage. The Israeli-owned global platform serves as a secondary market for private tech shares and it was declared to be one of the top 100 innovative companies in Europe in 2016. Joining us now with more is Chaim Schiff, co-founder of the Elephant Brokerage. Chaim, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tell us more about the Elephant. What does it mean to be a secondary marketplace, actually? Secondary marketplace is where sellers of private tech companies, the biggest companies, the biggest names in the world, who have been sitting on these shares for sometimes even 10 years, and they want to meet the money. And these companies take a longer time for them to go public. It can now take 12 years, 15 years. They want to see, uh, uh, they want to buy a house. They want to buy a new car. Um, on the other hand, and, and they understand that right now it, it's going to take some time. On the other hand, investors from all over the world read about these names every day in the news. They see the great progress, the great value, and they want to take a bite out of this, and they can't because even when these companies raise funds in a funding round, you don't have access to it. So our marketplace is basically a meeting point for them to meet each other and for the sellers to sell the shares to the investors who want to tap into these great companies. And how, see, how do you see the current market sentiment in private tech companies in light of the challenging public market? So obviously when you know, the public market is, has a negative sentiment, it affects the private companies as well. Uh, it goes hand in hand. But the process there takes a longer time. On the other hand, we're seeing that the sellers adapted to it very quickly. The pricing has adjusted very quickly. They understand that they need to give the protection that the investors are looking for. The investors, on the other hand, understand that there are great opportunities for them to get on you know, the cap table and join these great companies, access that companies were not willing to, to give beforehand. Um, and so for, for them, this is a great opportunity. So we're, we're happy because we have a decade-long experience in this market. We're seeing things going back to basics. And for us, this is a good, a good, a good uh, shift. And do you see any difference in the approach of tech companies towards secondary transactions? Yes, absolutely. Um, these companies have gotten used to the idea that they need to give liquidity solutions to their early shareholders, to their employees before they go public. It also takes the pressure off of them to go public. During the last few years, they had two channels, which were when they raised funds, some of it went to uh, secondary transactions. And the other way for them was to go public, and a lot of companies actually went public. Um, public markets are closed right now till further notice. Uh, when investors want to come in and invest in the companies, they want the money to go and be used by the companies to work and not to give liquidity to, uh, to their employees or to early investors. So the companies understand that they need to be more cooperative and more collaborative with secondary solutions. And we're seeing that you know, a lot of times now, companies are actually approaching us to build a liquidity program for them. Yes, and Chaim, looking at people who aren't very familiar with these subjects and in general, what do you offer people who want to buy stocks but they feel like they can't? I mean, do you have anything to offer them? That's a great question. I mean, we've, we're meeting with investors all the time. And a lot of times they say, you know, we understand the potential. We're seeing these great companies. How do we know to pick, you know, the right ones? So for them, we're launching right now a secondary, an institutional grade secondary uh, fund. We've put together an amazing investment committee with an investment experts with great experience. 
And for them, this could be a great opportunity to diversify their portfolio, to have professional people uh, uh, run these uh, uh, investments for them, and that can be a right, a right solution for them. So we're calling them to come and do it. It's At, a great solution. In due time. Thank you very much, Chaim, for being with us. Thanks, Amit. The 55-year-old victim, identified as Shalom Sofil, was stabbed in the Al Funduk village two weeks ago while exiting a store. He was able to make it to his car and drive to a nearby junction where he received medical attention from Israeli security forces and was then evacuated to the hospital. But his condition deteriorated and he succumbed to his wounds. Security forces arrested the Palestinian attacker following a brief manhunt in the area. According to the Israel Defense Forces, the incident was described as a terror attack. In a call that lasted eight minutes, U.S. President Joe Biden congratulated Benjamin Netanyahu on his success in the November 1st elections. Biden told Netanyahu that, quote, we are brothers, we will make history together, end quote, adding that his commitment to Israel was unquestionable. In response, Netanyahu thanked Biden for his personal friendship spanning 40 years and for his commitment to the state of Israel. Netanyahu added that it is within their reach to obtain additional peace agreements between Israel and Arab states and also to deal with the Iranian threat. Since the elections, Netanyahu has received a slew of calls and congratulations from world leaders welcoming him back into power, including from Ukrainian Prime Minister Vladimir Zelensky, newly elected UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni, and French President Emmanuel Macron, who also invited Netanyahu to Paris. Palestinian terrorists opening fire early Wednesday morning at security personnel, Jewish worshippers, local government officials, and Knesset members who were visiting Joseph's tomb in Shechem or Nablus. The holy tomb in Judea and Samaria, a.k.a. the West Bank, is a frequent target for attacks. And among the MKs touring the tomb, eight right-wing lawmakers, including from incoming Prime Minister Netanyahu's Likud party, as well as from the Shas Otsmayudit and the religious Zionism factions. The terrorists live fire targeting Israeli soldiers who had secured the area. The soldiers returning fire, killing one of the shooters, who was later identified as a 15-year-old militant from the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. No Israeli visitors or security personnel were reportedly injured. Still following the assault, Regional Council Chief Yossi Dagan, also present during the attack, repeating demands that the IDF station a full-time protective detail at the tomb as directed by what he calls the failed Oslo agreements. Meantime, in addition to securing the tomb, the IDF reportedly also operating in various towns across Judea and Samaria overnight, including in Shechem or Nablus, Bethlehem, and Nabi Saleh, a number of terror suspects and illegal weapons apprehended. Mysterious explosions were reported on the border between Iraq and Syria Tuesday night as unidentified aircraft believed to be American drones and helicopters targeting a convoy of Iranian militia and fuel tanker trucks. Arabic media reporting a series of airstrikes late Tuesday night. Mysterious explosions reported on the border between Iraq and Syria as unidentified aircraft targeting sites belonging to Iran-affiliated groups in the area, including a convoy of Iranian militia and fuel tanker trucks, and some 15 tankers carrying Iranian gasoline en route to Lebanon attacked, at least 25 Iran-affiliated militants reportedly killed, 10 more injured. Initially, the attack believed to be carried out by American drones and helicopters, as claimed by Iran's state TV, though the media company Press TV not providing any evidence for that claim. That said, the United States indeed conducting such airstrikes in the area in the recent past, including in August. The U.S. military striking Iran-backed militia in the Deir al-Zul region as a supposed message to Iran following the Iranians' targeting of American troops earlier that month and several more times throughout the year. Responding to allegations, meantime, senior U.S. officials reportedly confirming the airstrikes but saying that the U.S. was not involved. Rather, the unnamed official alleging that the strikes conducted by an unidentified party now assumed to be Israel. Turning now to the United States midterm elections, the race currently still too close to call as Republicans and Democrats are neck and neck for control of both houses of Congress. ILTV's Steve Leibowitz with the latest. Hours after polls are closed, the Democrats and Republicans remain in a struggle to control both houses of Congress. There were apparently some modest gains for Republicans in the House of Representatives, but control of the Senate is a nail-biter and will likely not be decided until all the votes are counted. It could also come down to a runoff in Georgia two weeks from now. Traditionally, the party of the president loses ground in the midterms, but there has not been a Republican wave this time. 
They have already lost one Senate seat in Pennsylvania and will need to flip two between the states of Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia in order to take control of that chamber. So it is entirely possible that we do not have a full picture of the numbers for a number of days. And that is a good thing. It doesn't mean that something's wrong. It means that something is right. It means we're taking a moment to count every ballot. In New York, Democratic Governor Kathy Hochul and Jewish Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer both scored victories over their Republican challengers. Hochul went against Lee Zeldin, a Jewish congressman from Long Island. Zeldin made it close with a great deal of crossover vote in the Jewish community. In Florida, potential presidential candidate Ron DeSantis was easily re-elected governor. The re-election sets DeSantis up for a possible presidential run in 2024. That likelihood has already drawn the ire of Republican former President Donald Trump. Trump has nicknamed him Ron DeSanctimonious. Trump said he would make a major announcement next Tuesday when he is likely expected to declare his presidential candidacy. Now, in a shocking development, North Korea reportedly hacking an Israeli company that deals with cryptocurrency in an apparent hope of stealing digital coin to finance its nuclear program in Pyongyang. According to Israeli media N12, the hacking attempt was carried out by North Korean actors posing as the Israeli crypto company's Japanese supplier. And it was detected by Israeli cybersecurity firm Confidas, which, manages, which managed to halt the electronic break-in in its tracks. But an apparently lucky catch, Confidas explaining that the hacking methods were long-term, sophisticated, and in some cases, not seen before. Confidas CEO Ram Levy saying that these attacks don't happen overnight, and normally they operate along a pattern, starting with gaining the target's trust before sending malicious files that can corrupt the target's network. The North Koreans, on the other hand, simply spying, stealing money, and disappearing, all with little to no interaction opposite the target. That said, North Korea's use of hackers to penetrate financial institutions is well documented. They were behind the theft of as much as $100 million worth of cryptocurrency from a company in June. And according to The Guardian, it was part of the Iranian regime's attempts to secure funding for its nuclear and ballistic missiles program. And that's it for ILTV's Weekly Review. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next week.